This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Big prize, Pfizer beat out its rivals to buy the maker of a blockbuster cancer drug and is paying a big premium. Taking aim, two senators want to know why the price of Mylan's EpiPens have shot higher. Facing charges, a former CEO from the high-flying dot-com days is returning to the U.S. after being indicted a decade ago. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, August 22nd. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Pfizer won the bidding war. The largest U.S. drug maker is buying Medivation, beating out a handful of its rivals who had also shown interest in acquiring the biotech. Sanofi made an overture for Medivation back in April. Since then, other suitors reportedly followed, including AstraZeneca, Celgene, and Gilead Sciences. But it was Pfizer's $14 billion offer that won out, sending shares of Medivation up almost 20 percent. Shares of Pfizer fell slightly. Meg Terrell tells us why Medivation was so sought after. A $14 billion deal, and investors hope the biotech blues may be over. Pfizer beat out rivals, including French drug maker Sanofi, to win Medivation in an all-cash deal that capped a months-long process. With it, Pfizer gains the prostate cancer drug Extandi, which draws more than $2 billion in annual revenue, proceeds that are split with Medivation's partner, Astellas. Pfizer also gains two experimental drugs for cancer, building up a growing focus of the company. The market for cancer drugs is large and growing fast. Global spending on cancer medicines reached $107 billion last year and is expected to top $150 billion by 2020. Pfizer and other drug makers have made it a priority, which has put biotechnology companies focused on cancer in the crosshairs for acquisitions. Investor Les Funtleiter, whose E-squared Asset Management owns Pfizer shares, says the drug giant should do more deals like this one to gain an even bigger presence in important areas, including immunotherapy, harnessing the immune system to fight cancer. Biotechnology investors rejoiced at the Medivation deal as well as the premium paid. It was 20 percent more than Medivation's closing share price Friday, but almost $5 billion more than Sanofi originally offered in April. Speculation more consolidation would follow drove shares up across the biotechnology sector. Analysts cited Insight, which focuses on cancer drugs, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, which works on cystic fibrosis medicines, and Biomarin, which is developing drugs for rare diseases, as potential targets. The year for biotechnology stocks has been rocky, with an increased focus on drug prices during the U.S. election. But investors like Funtleiter say they see little the government can do to tamp down on rising cancer drug prices, making a $14 billion or bet like this one, less risky. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Meg Terrell. Mylan Pharmaceuticals is being targeted by some high-level senators. In a letter to Mylan CEO, Republican Chuck Grassley of Iowa asked for information on the rapid increase in the cost of Mylan's EpiPens, which he says could limit access to the medication. This weekend, Democratic Senator Amy Klobuchar called on the Senate Judiciary Committee to hold a hearing on the price increases. EpiPens, which can stop a potentially life-threatening allergic reaction, have reportedly risen from around $100 back in 2008 to well above $500 at retail today. The company reportedly made $1.2 billion in profit on the injection device just last year. Mylan, in response to an NBC News report, said prices have, quote, changed over time to better reflect important product features and the value the product provides. Here to talk more about this big jump in cost for EpiPens is David Maris, a senior analyst at Wells Fargo Securities. The stock was down significantly today as the reports on this uh, price increase uh, have, have spread. Uh, two questions here. The company says they have invested a lot in these devices. Have they? Is the product materially different than it was in 2008? Is it in any sense justified that they're charging what they are today? So since 2013, the price has doubled thereabouts. It's still epinephrine in, an, in a syringe, and it still saves people's lives. I don't know how much it's changed, 
but to double the price seems like a lot. You know, full disclosure, I carry EpiPens for my children. All three of them need to use them. I have not, in answer to your question, seen any change in the design of the EpiPen since I've been carrying them. But I guess my question is what type of percentage increases are we talking about and how often have they been increasing the price of the drug? So it's changed over time a little, you know, sometimes uh, it's 15%, sometimes it's 10% twice a year. For the last couple of years, it's been 15% price increases twice a year. So like I said, in 2013, in, in around November of 2013, so very late, it was $300, now it's $600. And I read that the actual cost of the medication in each one of these is something like a dollar. It's just generic epinephrine, right? Single. You're paying for the delivery device here. You're, I don't know what you're paying for, but it is single dollars. It's very inexpensive, and it you know, frankly, shouldn't cost $600 a, a, a tube. So what happens next? I mean, obviously, Senator Grassley wants to, to hold some hearings and find out more information about this. But this is not the first time that we've seen companies be scrutinized for dramatic price increases. Um, Mylan stock fell on the news. Could it be hurt more as those hearings take place? So what we saw with Valiant, when they went through this, their stock came down quite a bit. But this is also tied to their, to their business. Here, this is Mylan's largest product, so it could be a vulnerability to the stock. But more importantly, what are the senators going to do? Are they just going to talk the talk this time? Or because it's children and, and adults and this is life-saving medicine, are they going to actually do something this time? What about the FDA? I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. What about the FDA? They've had a generic that's out there, but they have failed to move on it. Would, might this nudge them, do you think? We don't have any transparency on that. That's one thing that I think we should have, is the FDA should come clean on what's been holding up a generic. The product doesn't have a patent. So Teva Pharmaceuticals has filed a patent, uh, have filed for the generic. They have been turned down a couple times. So what's the delay? So do, does Mylan set the retail price of this medication? Uh, in other words, what I would pay at a CVS or a Walgreens? And what percentage of the, of the people who need it, like Sue, pay that full retail price? So we don't have data on that. But what I can tell you is, based on their disclosures, the profitability of the product has gone up in the last couple of years. So the company might say they're investing a lot in the product, but based on their disclosures, it looks like they, they're making more money, not just on a dollar terms, but about 60 cents of every dollar's worth of sales, they make an operating profit. David, thank you very much. David Maris you, David. with Wells Fargo Securities. Thanks. Thank you. And another major health concern is Zika. An official from the National Institutes of Health says the virus could spread to Texas and Louisiana next because they are in semi-tropical regions. And Louisiana is especially vulnerable because of the flooding and the problems getting rid of all that standing water. Funding to fight the disease has been stalled in Congress. President Obama will head to Louisiana tomorrow to survey the damage from the catastrophic flooding in that state. It's being called the worst natural disaster in this country since Hurricane Sandy four years ago. And while the human toll is immeasurable, the financial toll is just now starting to be tallied. Morgan Brennan has our report. It's now being called the Great Flood of 2016. Torrential rains caused historic flooding in parts of Louisiana. Many neighborhoods in the Baton Rouge and Lafayette areas were submerged, with at least 13 people dead and tens of thousands more displaced. More than 60,000 homes have been damaged, but only some of them had flood insurance. There were 25,500 claims filed so far. They expect that number to rise, although we don't expect the number of claims in this case to be as historic as they were after Sandy or Katrina, which were in the 40 and 50,000 range claim numbers. Yet more than 100,000 people have filed for assistance, according to the Federal Emergency Management Agency. FEMA says it will cap grants at $33,000. While more than 40 percent of all Louisiana homes have flood insurance, making it the third largest market in the U.S., many affected homes were not in high-risk zones and therefore were not required to have the supplemental government-backed coverage. Data from FEMA, which underwrites coverage, shows less than 15 percent of homes in the hardest hit parishes actually had it. One of the things that's important to remember is that if you have a federally backed mortgage and you're in what they call the 100 year flood zone or you're in a flood plain, that you're required to buy the flood insurance. What people don't realize is just because you're not required to buy flood insurance don't, doesn't mean you don't have flood risk, as many people unfortunately are finding out now in the Louisiana area. But the financial effects go beyond housing as well. 
Many local businesses also sustain damages, and farmers are worried about the rice crop, which is ready for harvest. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan. On Wall Street, stocks started the week mostly lower as oil prices dragged down the Dow and the S&P 500. This is investors look to Fed Chair Janet Yellen's speech a bit later this week in Jackson Hole. Today, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 23 points to 18,529. The Nasdaq added six, and the S&P 500 was off one. Ahead of Chair Yellen's speech on Friday, the Federal Reserve Vice Chair says the U.S. economy is already close to meeting the central bank's targets. In a speech this past weekend, Stanley Fisher said he expects growth to pick up as investment recovers. Some interpret Fisher's upbeat assessment of the economy. Uh, they think that that might mean an interest rate hike could be coming sometime later this year. The central bank next meets next month. Investors are putting more money into stock funds. Recent data from Bank of America Merrill Lynch shows inflows into equity funds are at their highest level this year. But investors continue to favor passive or index investments over actively managed ones. Mike Santoli explains why and what it might say about market sentiment. Fewer and fewer investors are trying to beat the stock market. The long-running rush of money into index funds has accelerated this year. These so-called passive funds, such as the pioneering Vanguard 500, simply seek to match the overall market performance. More than $900 billion has flowed into index funds, including exchange-traded versions, since 2009, with $160 billion entering in the first half of 2016 alone. On the losing end, actively managed stock funds, in which a manager tries to pick stocks that outperform an index. These funds have shed more than $200 billion this year, according to industry estimates. Now, the virtues of index funds are well known. They deliver broad market exposure while charging very low fees and minimizing taxes. Their appeal has grown in part as investors focus more on just how hard it is to find active managers who can outpace the market over time. Now, of course, indexing also becomes fashionable after a bull market has been rolling along for a while, as the current one has. And a strategy's popularity has often peaked just as stock pickers began to mount a comeback. Some market analysts suggest we might be nearing such a point right now. They note that all the money is going to funds that don't research companies or try to distinguish among better and weaker stocks. So does this mean more opportunity for active managers to find those attractive stocks? Perhaps. In the past few months, the average stock in the S&P 500 has been outperforming the overall index. That's a small hint that stock pickers are having it a bit easier. But active fund managers start with a handicap of higher fees and a lot of academic evidence that investment skill is fleeting. Stock pickers will have to go on a convincing winning streak against the market if they hope to turn the tide against those efficient mechanical index funds. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mike Santoli at the New York Stock Exchange. Still ahead, one of the last remaining cases of the dot-com era may finally be headed to a close. A blast from the past in white-collar crime. Kobe Alexander, who founded one-time tech darling Converse Technology, then moved to Africa just before being indicted for securities fraud 10 years ago, has agreed to come back to the U.S. and face the music. Scott Cohn broke the story earlier today and has our report tonight. It is one of the last remaining criminal cases from the dot-com era, and maybe the most colorful. Jacob Kobe Alexander helped invent voicemail. His company, Converse Technology, became a high flyer. But the feds say he masterminded a 15-year scheme to manipulate the value of Converse options, cheating shareholders out of millions. With a grand jury indictment looming in 2006, he moved to Namibia, which had no extradition treaty with the U.S. Months later, we tracked him down. You might not just go back to the States and clear your name. But why would you not do that? He was already well established in Namibia by then and contributing lavishly by Namibian standards, building affordable housing, donating to education. All too transparent, charged his critics in the U.S. It looks like he's trying to influence the, the politics of Namibia to keep him there. His attorneys flatly denied that, even as extradition proceedings dragged on. Alexander went on to establish soup kitchens that reportedly feed hundreds of children per day. 
He didn't ignore his legal troubles in the U.S., settling every lawsuit, including one by his own company, and agreeing to pay $53 million to the Securities and Exchange Commission. But the criminal case would be more complicated. Previously charged with 35 felony counts, Alexander, who's now 64, will plead guilty to a single count of securities fraud this week. His attorney says even though Alexander is leaving Namibia, he and his family will continue their charitable work there, still undetermined whether he'll have to do it from prison. Even though Kobe Alexander fought extradition for years, the U.S. government never formally declared him a fugitive. That's in part because he moved to Africa before he was indicted. And that may have created just enough room to cut a deal and bring this case and maybe a whole era to an end once and for all. Scott Cohn, Nightly Business Report, Mountain View, California. And to read more about Kobe Alexander and his return to the U.S., head to our website, nbr.com. U.S. regulators give ChemChina the green light to buy Syngenta. And that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The Chinese chemical company said that a U.S. National Security Committee has approved the company's proposed takeover of the Swiss seed maker. Despite this latest approval, though, the $43 billion proposed acquisition still faces scrutiny from many regulators around the world. Syngenta shares, nonetheless, popped 10 percent on the news to 87.78. Valiant Pharmaceuticals names a new chief financial officer. The drug maker says that Paul Henredeen from animal health company Zoetis will take over the role, replacing Valiant's Robert Rosiello. Rosiello is expected to remain at Valiant in an executive position. Investors liked what they heard. Valiant shares rose more than 8.5 percent to 31.27. Intercil is reportedly in talks to be sold. According to Reuters, the chipmaker may soon be bought by a Japanese technology company for $3 billion. Any deal could be reached as early as this month. Intercil shares surged more than 19 percent to $18.74. A potential board shakeup at Williams Companies. Hedge fund Corvex management founder Keith Meister said that he will nominate 10 candidates to replace the energy company's current board of directors. Meister said that he will initially nominate 10 Corvex employees before securing independent director directors recruited by the hedge fund. Shares fell nearly 1 percent to 20 743. Steve Wynn is rolling the dice on Macau. The casino tycoon is opening a $4 billion resort, the most expensive property in the only part of China where gambling is legal. But as Susan Lee reports, it comes as the world's biggest casino market remains in the grips of a gaming slump. A $100 million fountain show, $200 million in art and Chinese antiques, opulence and showmanship. That's what gaming mogul Steve Wynn is known for. And he brings it in spades to his new $4 billion Wynn Palace, the most expensive casino ever built in Macau or Las Vegas. But the timing of the opening may prove to be tough, with gaming revenues now falling for 26 straight months in the world's largest gambling enclave. But we're going to have to wait to find out. What usually happens, the market grows or it doesn't. If it doesn't, then the market share shifts to the newer, more beautiful buildings that resonate with public taste. The new casino is when doubling down on their premium gambler, the VIPs. The problem is they're not going to Macau like they used to, scared away by China's anti-corruption crackdown. And that's not the only problem. The Wind Palace was only given 150 new tables, which is the lowest for a casino of this size and cost. The good news for Wynn is that they will be able to move 200 tables from his other casinos into the palace. The more tables you have, the more money you make. However, if he does that, he basically takes business away from his other Macau properties. Despite the challenges, though, numerous analysts still remain bullish. I think what people have to remember is Wynn creates an aspirational product that people want to go to. We actually did a survey earlier this year that found that 26% um, of Chinese gamblers are going to return to the market and gamble more once Wynn Palace opens. Another tailwind, Macau may finally be hitting bottom, seeing positive gaming revenues possibly in August or September, according to the forecast. And as the saying goes, the house always wins and casinos do make money. For the Wind Palace, though, it might take a little bit longer. For Nightly Business Reports, I'm Susan Lee. 
Coming up, big budget bust. Why this summer's anything but hot for Hollywood. The Olympic swimmer Ryan Lochte has lost all four of his sponsors. Man, was that quick. The decisions by Speedo, Ralph Lauren, Airweave, and Gentle Hair Removal follow a drunken incident during the Rio Games that he first described, Lochte that is, as an armed robbery. We know better now. Speedo plans to donate 50 grand of Lochte's fee to save the children to benefit needy youngsters in Brazil. Hollywood's latest attempt at a big budget blockbuster went bust. Ben-Hur had the most dismal opening of any wide release this summer. And as Julia Borston reports, the studio behind the movie also finds itself at the center of the Viacom mess. Ben-Hur's $11 million U.S. box office gross was even worse than low expectations. Bad news for Paramount and MGM, which together spent $100 million to produce the film and more to market it. It pushes Viacom's Paramount further into the loser category after failed sequels to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Zoolander earlier this year. Analyst Michael Nathanson calling Paramount's problems truly shocking, saying the studio may lose $350 million this year. More bad news for parent Viacom in the midst of management upheaval. You're having a volatile boardroom that probably you don't have the sort of uh, big budget leadership there that maybe Bob Iger has been able to, to have having those acquisitions with Disney. This year we're seeing the biggest gap between studio leaders and laggards of the century. Paramount and Sony both have just 7% box office market share this year compared to Disney's 27%. Disappointment from Paramount and Sony dragging the summer box office below last year's, while the year-to-date box office is actually up 5%. Blockbusters are less concentrated in the summer, with Star Wars The Force Awakens and others outperforming this winter. It's not a seasonal business anymore. We're talking about a year-round release schedule when big movies can come out in February, like Deadpool, or in March, like Batman vs. Superman. Plus, there's sequel and remake fatigue, with 17 this summer compared to 11 sequels and remakes last year and 13 the year before, according to Comscore. And with more new original content available to stream on Netflix and Amazon, the bar is higher than ever to get people to a theater, while talk of a bad movie spreads like wildfire on social media. So negative reviews like Ben-Hur's 28% Rotten Tomatoes rating can really sting. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. And finally tonight, the most expensive car auction of the year wrapped up last night at Pebble Beach. We told you Friday that there were questions about the strength of the market for classic cars. And tonight, Robert Frank has some of the numbers that show it is losing speed. Sales fell for the second year in a row, offering the latest sign that the classic car prices may be stalling out. Sales at the five auctions around the Concorde d'Elegance totaling $345 million. That's down from last year and 2014. Nearly half the cars up for auction failed to sell. But despite the overall sales decline, the rarest, most expensive masterpiece cars continue to set records and lift the average sale price, which this year rose to $480,000 a car. Now, the top seller of the weekend was this 1955 Jaguar D-type Roadster that was sold by RM Sotheby's for nearly $22 million. It became the most expensive British car ever sold at auction. And a new record was set for the most expensive American car ever sold at auction, the first ever Shelby Cobra from 1962, selling for almost $14 million. And newer cars made after the 1990s fared poorly over the weekend, but the first two LaFerraris ever sold at auction did well, with the red one selling for $3.5 million and the black one selling for roughly $5.2 million. That's three times the original sale price just two years ago. Not bad for a used car. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Robert Frank. That does it for Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. We'd like to remind you that this is the time of year your public television station seeks your support. And I'm Tyler Mathis, and we thank you for your support. Have a great evening, everyone. We'll see you back here tomorrow.